Congratulations, you made it to church today. <laughs> Slushy, sloppy, time change. Yes, amen for coffee. Hallelujah. You're here. And it is good for us to be together. Just a couple things that will, I think, enhance your experience on Sunday mornings. One would be, as you are preparing your physical body to attend church, and we're grateful that you all done that, right? I did the same. We took a shower this morning. That as we participate or, and, um, excuse me, as we prepare for Sunday, I want us also to come with anticipation. So there's preparation and anticipation. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I come to church, we come, we come here because this is what we do, right? We're Christians. I've been doing this for whatever X amount of years or what have you. And I'm glad that you're here in that way. But I'm telling you, if you pause and pray, and it's not, it doesn't have to be a lengthy prayer, it's, God, will you open my heart, God, to anticipate what you will do today when we gather? If you come with that type of mindset, believe me, you will receive something from the service, from a conversation in the cafe, from a song, I don't know. So I'm encouraging you, okay, I'm encouraging us as a congregation, as we prepare for gathering together on Sunday mornings, that we would have a spirit of anticipation. God, will you speak to me today? God, will you show me something? God, will you move among us? And with that preparation and anticipation, there needs to be participation. Okay, so granted, God can move on a rock, okay? However, God steers things just like a car. It's more easily steered when it's starting to move, right? Participating. I want you to know when you're not here, your absence makes a difference. Because when you're here, you have a job to do. Part of your job is to worship God, right? Part of it is hearing your voice in the congregation. Part of it is a smile or a handshake or a hug or an amen or just your presence matters. And so I encourage you to engage, right? Regardless if it's your favorite song or your least favorite song, right? Regardless if you're not feeling the best or your, your favorite person isn't here, okay? participate and anticipate and expect God to do something. And I believe he will do that because he is faithful to do that. You are also prayed for. Do you know that? Right? You are prayed for. This meeting here and our meetings during out the week, we ask God to do his work among us. Right? Don't you want God to do his work among us? We can say, amen, God, do what only you can do. We can prepare ourselves, but you are the one that changes hearts. You are the one that heals wounds. You are the one that opens eyes. You are the one that works among us and in us and around us. And so we ask God to do that and expect God to be working. And so I pray, God, give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, give us a heart to be open. And if you do that in this place, or if you attend another service someplace, open your heart and say, God, I'm here to worship you. If that is your aim, that is your goal, the only person that can stop you from worshiping him is you, okay? No one or nothing else. So when we come together, as we are getting ready for Sunday morning, I'm asking us to think this way, act this way. And believe me, we will see God moving among us. You will feel it, you'll hear, and you'll understand some things. And I know that Sunday morning, you are going to remember very little of what I talk about today. Even though I take hours and hours and hours and hours to prepare, probably you'll remember just a little bit. But may that little bit make a difference, right? God can speak to us in a sentence 
or a paragraph or a concept, right? And so I put stuff out there. We're going to go through scripture again today because the word of God uh, has power in it. And so the prayer is that God would speak to you just a sentence or perhaps a prayer or, or something that you are recognizing or thinking about that God would speak to you today. So I'm anticipating a sentence will make a difference to you. I don't know what sentence. I hope at least one does, right? But a sentence will make a difference, okay? So I'm just going to do a quick prayer and we're going to jump into the word, all right? So God, thank you for um, your spirit moving among us. Thank you that we have your word. God, thank you that you've given me an opportunity to study it. And God, help me to communicate well, God. And will you open our ears today, our eyes today, our hearts today. God, will you continue to speak to us today. God, grateful for this team leading us. Grateful for the choir uh, ministering to us. Grateful for the prayers that have been said. God, grateful that we are helped to be here. And God, during this space, Lord, do something that I can't do. Lord, do your work among us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, as stated, we are continuing in our series. So we are in John chapter 3. So if you do have a Bible, go ahead and open it up. And we are going to start with the verse we ended with last week, John 3.16. And we're going to look at the next section. Now, if you have a printed Bible or if your electronic Bible has Jesus' letters in red, you'll notice that our passage today will be completely in red. So what we're focusing in on is not John's inspired word to us, but Jesus' very word to us. And so it is important that we pay attention to what is being proclaimed in this chapter. And as you read the book of John, I want you to do so through the framework of John's aim for us in writing this gospel. It's found in John chapter 20, if you can go to the next side, verse 21. And so I'm having us read this together because reputation helps us to remember things, okay? So we're going to read this together and we'll use this as a, uh, a lens as we read through the book of John. You'll see it time and time and time and time and time again where John is bringing forward the testimony and miracles and teachings of Jesus so that we would believe and have life in his name, okay? So let's just say this together and we'll, we'll do the reference and read it together. So here we go. John 20, 31. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is the aim, that you would believe and so doing that you and I would have life. Not in our name, but in the name that is above every name. So that's his aim. So I'm going to read our passage of scripture in its entirety. Okay, I'm going to read the whole passage. Then we're going to pause and we're going to break it down. There's five points. I know that's a lot, okay? But five things that I'm highlighting this morning that are here in the text for us to consider, for you to understand, so that your faith would be built up, right? Your mind would be centered and that God would be glorified. So that's what we're looking to do, that we would learn, that we would understand, that we would internalize and then live these truths out. So here it is. John chapter 3, starting with verse 16, down to verse 21. I'm just going to read it for us. So it says this, <clears throat> excuse me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he or she has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. 
And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. There is some significant theology in this. And often people quote John 3.16, not fully understanding what led to it, and not really comprehending what leads from it. And so these verses are connected to the amazing thought that God so loved the world. And this is our first point. The love of God. I want us to consider this. Now God loved the world. So we ask our, have to ask ourselves, well, why? Well, it's obviously because we're so lovable, right? Just look at us. We're beautiful. We're kind. We smell nice, right? We have beautiful lashes, right? God, of course, couldn't help himself because we, by gosh, are so lovable, right? That's why God loved us, right? Ah, that's not why God loves us, right? Well, it must be because uh, we loved him first, right? God saw that we loved him. We adored him. We couldn't get enough of him. And so, out of obligation, he says, well, I suppose I should love them back, right? Because we loved him so much, right? Is that true? No, that's not true either, right? So God loves us not because we're so lovable or because we loved him first. He loves us because that is who he is, right? And God's love is amazing. All right. God's love is amazing, right? And we say, well, it's amazing because the world is so big. That's why God's love is amazing, because there's so many of us. The truth is, God's love is, is not primarily amazing because of the breadth, breadth, of, breadth of it, the width of it. It's amazing because of the depths of it. It's not because the world is so big. It's because the world is so bad. Right? While we were sinners, what? Christ died for us. Just like Margie was saying to us. Right? God loved us when we were rebelling against him. God loved us when we were running from him. God loved us when we were hiding from him in the darkness of our desires. God loved us so much. It is seen in, of course, the gift of, the sacrificial love of God and giving of his son. God's love is unselfish. God's love is costly. God's love, of course, is Praise worthy. And I want you to know if you have ever second guessed if God loves you, all you need to do is look no farther than Jesus, right? In Him is the proof of God's love, not just for the world, but for you, and you, and you, and me. God sent His Son. For us collectively, and he sent his son for us individually, which reaches down to you and me. So I never want you to second guess God's love because he promises to always be with you and to never forsake you, and he is true to that word, right? Regardless if the sun is shining or you can't find any hope, God is with you. His love is consistent. He has not forsaken you nor turned his back upon you. Remember God's great 
love. And because of his great love, he gives us new birth into a new life that is only possible by his great, boundless, sacrificial love. And this great love of God creates great love within yourself. Now, I remember before I was really walking with Christ that I was pretty insecure and I was looking to be loved. And so I interacted with people because I wanted them to like me. Perhaps you're way better than I am, but that's how I thought. Because I did not think I was worthy of love because my dad ran off with another woman. People weren't necessarily involved in my life. I was poor. I was skinny. I had buck teeth. And I was a little weird, which the weirdness has remained. But other things have changed. All right. I was pretty insecure. Right? And so I tried to figure out what people wanted and what they would like and I turned into a chameleon. So with these people, I acted a certain way, so in the hopes that they would love me. And with these people over here, I'd morph into something else in the hopes that they would accept me. After I fully came to Christ and understand and read his word and recognized that God loved me, me for who I was. It was revolutionary. And so now no longer was I looking to other people so that I would get love. I knew that God loved me so I was engaging with them to give love. Do you get the difference, right? Change me instead of being insecure and wanting people to like me to saying, God already loves me. It's cool. I'm here to love you. God Love changes us, our identity, perhaps to a degree, our personality, our perspective as well. It matters and changes us. So John 3.16, which is foundational, it's a gospel per se in a sentence, should be known by us, memorized, internalized, and thought through. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And there are sermons within just that scripture. Now, today we are connecting it with the rest of the teachings connected to this. And we'll look again at the rest of the chapter next week. So then he connects that profound statement with some profound truth verse 17 let's think about this for god did not send his son into the world to condemn it so he wasn't coming to condemn the world but he sent his son in order that the world might be saved through him let's pause a moment and focus in on the uniqueness of jesus this is the next point the unique of Jesus. Do you know that there is no one like Jesus? Okay? He was not just a mere man that that you know gave his life as an example for us, right? And some people like to to picture Jesus as, you know, the best of us and that we should follow his example. Well, in one sense, should we follow Jesus' example? The answer is yeah, right? But he is unique in the sense that he always existed. He was never created, even though he came in the, as a man. But he was what scripture calls the second Adam. Now, now the first Adam, if you're familiar with scripture, is found in Genesis. This is our great ancestor, right? Humanity coming from the first couple. And Adam and Eve, they failed in following and loving and knowing and obeying God. But Jesus, as the second Adam, right, not having sin within, never sinned. That is uniquely, uh, he is uniquely qualified to do something that no other person can do. 
no other religious leader, no other thought, no other person. He is uniquely qualified to take on himself what is due us because of our trespass or our sin against God. He is the Lamb of God, right, who was slain before the creation of the world. And so he could take the punishment on himself for our sin because he did not have any sin. Therefore, he is qualified and he rightly gave and lovingly gave of himself for us. Now, Scripture all over the place talks about his uniqueness. I'm going to rifle through a number of passages that points to this. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This is what it reads. For our sake, he, which is God, made him Christ to be sin, who knew no sin. Why? So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's another great one to memorize. Galatians 3, 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And Jesus pointed to that last week. We looked at what Christ did by giving his life for us. He became a curse for us so that we would be free of the curse. Now this was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 45. God told, tells us, his people, turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth, there it is, God so loved the world. For I am God, and there are no others. He is the most high. There is no one like him, and also Acts proclaims, and there is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. All right? This is, this is an underlying verse, right? There is no other name that people can be saved besides Jesus. He is unique. He is powerful. He is Lord, and he is with us. No other person claiming sinless perfection did so by how they lived. And people do claim that, well, they're Jesus, right, in the flesh. They're not, right? There is only one. Jesus backed up his claim by how he lived. Now, Jesus could have condemned the world, right? He could have came to the world and said, hmm, Y'all got problems, right? I don't got no problems. You all are horrible. See ya. Right? Jesus didn't have to go to the cross, by the way. Jesus could have entered heaven and been examined by the judge and would have been found innocent. He could have walked in on his own merit, right? Sorry for all those suckers down there, right? He could have. He's the only one. By the way, you cannot, I cannot, no matter how quote-unquote righteous you are, all have fallen short. But he didn't come to condemn the world. He came to give his life to redeem the world because of the great love of God. He came to save the world. So if someone asks you, which I hope that they do... But if someone asked you, why did God send his son into the world? Please don't answer to be a good example, right? Please don't answer. Well, to teach us some things. Was he a good example? Yeah. Did he teach us some things? Absolutely. Was that the main reason he came? Nope. Right? Why did God send his son into the world? So the world might be saved through him. That's the reason. That's the primary purpose that Jesus was here. Right here from the scripture. Now it goes on. Now we're understanding that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world because of the love of God for the world. 
Verse 18 says this, as Jesus is teaching, the Reverend Dr. Nicodemus says this, whoever believes in him is not condemned. The good news is you and I are included in the word whoever, right? Everyone has opportunity for salvation by coming to Christ. Even your cranky neighbor, even your mother-in-law, right? Everyone, whomever believes in him is not condemned. That, my friends, is good news. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. That's the bad news. Why? Well, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. God. That's important. That's heavy. That's hopeful and horrible all at the same time. So in this verse, we need to talk about two things. Right? First is the meaning of belief. Second, the state of humanity. Right, so this is the next point, the meaning of belief, okay? If you go back to that verse, 318, okay, you're going to see this word, believe in here, three times. Whoever believes right, in him is not condemned. That seems important to believe. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So we have to ask ourselves, what does believe mean? Okay. Now, many people in our society say they believe in Jesus. If we went out to stroll on state or we just went to the mall or wherever people hang out, right? And we ask this question, do you believe in Jesus? Most people will say, yeah, right? Well, I, I believe in Jesus. But I have to ask the question. Well, what do you mean by you saying that you believe in Jesus? Like, you believe what about Jesus, right? What do you mean believe in Jesus? There's a big difference between believing in, in someone versus believing things about someone. Okay? Big difference. And I have an illustration that will help with this point. Okay. So a high school basketball player, just put yourself thinking about this, a high school basketball player, for example, who believes in his coach because his coach is a former NBA champion. He believes in his coach. This high school basketball player will do whatever that coach says. He believes that his coach is right. So if the coach says to change his technique or to change his sh shooting motion, that high school player will do what he is asked and told to do. Even though it might feel awkward, even though he might uh, have a trouble adjusting how he shoots for a time, he will change his technique. Now if the coach says to run, I don't know, four miles a day or to lift weights 30 minutes each day, this young man will do it even though it hurts. The coach says, hey, 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 stop shooting so much. Pass the ball more and shoot less for the sake of the team. That young man, because he believes in his coach, will accept that role. Why? Because the athlete believes the coach knows better than he does as to what makes a winner. When you truly believe in a person in authority, you follow that person in complete obedience. The athlete who does not truly believe in the coach will not fully follow. Now, he may believe things about the coach. For example, that he's a former NBA champion, that he's honest, that his name might be Michael. Right? But believing... Certain information and believing in someone's authority are two 
different things. Those who believe in Jesus, not only believe the facts about his deity, his atoning death, his resurrection, they believe in his right to direct their lives. True believers follow. Now it's better if we were asking that question, do you believe in Jesus? It'd be better asked to say, do you follow Jesus? That's a great question for you and I. So if you say you believe, and believe is so important, right? It's the difference between guilty and innocent, right? It's the difference between condemnation and freedom. Belief is the difference in the one who lived life perfectly, gave his life for us, so that believing, looking to the one who has given his life, we may go free. Our part is to believe. Believe means, to believe in means that you not just believe things about him, but you put your trust in him. Right? Treasure him. Follow him. Trust Do you trust him? Are you following him? Are you learning to be like him? Are you a disciple of his? That matters because belief matters. And I do not know your heart, but God does. God, help us to put our Trust in him. Whoever believes in him experiences new birth. Whoever believes in him receives forgiveness of our sins. The washing of water and being made new by the spirit. He gives us a new heart. He gives us eternal life. He saves us and promises an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading amongst other things. That's the good news. The bad news is the alternative to not believe in Christ according to scripture is to perish, to lose one's life, to be doomed to destruction. There is no third option. This is heavy, right? The good news, in order to be good, has to be connected to the bad news. And the bad news, as Christ goes on to tell us, is that we are condemned already. We have a choice to either follow him or reject him, but there isn't a third option, as some religions will say. Well, you get reincarnated again, or you can work it out in purgatory. Scripture does not um, have those concepts at all. It's appointed for a person to die, and then what happens next? Then to face judgment. That's what it says. Doesn't it say, all right, nice try. Go back in there and try again harder. Life is not a dress rehearsal. Now, do we grow and learn? Absolutely. Do we become um, like Christ through the sanctification process? Yes. Are we justified through faith? Yes. We'll be glorified in heaven? Yes. God gives us opportunity time and time again. Scripture is clear. <laughs> Ported for, it's appointed for a person to die. Which is the penalty of our sin. But after that, there is an accounting. And Scripture is clear about this. So belief matters because the love of God matters. And the reality of our life matters. And this is the next point. The state of humanity. Right? The state of humanity. 
And often we leave this out because, again, this is the bad news. Again, if I went down to the mall, right, or I went down to State Street and say, are people good? How do you think most people will respond? Of course we are. Right? We're good, but sometimes, occasionally, we do bad things. Right? Are we good? Oh, yeah, we're good. Oh, yeah. well, I'm good. You're good. We're all good. Right? It's all good, brother. Okay. The more majority of people will say that people are basically good, right? Here's the deal. The Bible and Jesus do not affirm that thought. <laughs> they don't say, hey. It's like, no. And that's sobering, right? The Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Quotes the psalm that says, there is no one righteous. Not even your grandmother, right? As holy as she is. There's no one righteous, not even one. So let us not fool ourselves. Paul goes on and says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus said, no one is good except God alone. And here in this passage, whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the the only Son of God. Condemned, right? I don't like that sound of that word, right? Condemned from the beginning. If you're watching the news, right, you see guys being declared Condemned, guilty of murder of a wife and of a child. You know what condemned looks and sounds like? Guilty. And why? Why do we, or they, remained condemned for all the sins they've committed? And we commit sins? (laughs) Yeah. But this especially, they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Jesus came into the world that was already condemned. He didn't come into a neutral world in which the world in which he would condemn some and save others, right? So Jesus came into the world that was condemned, 100% lost. He didn't come again into a neutral world where some would be condemned and some would be saved. We're all guilty in nature. We were by nature objects of wrath, Ephesians 2. And despite this desperate status, we were made alive with Christ because of God's great love for us. This God who is rich in mercy gives us new Life And Jesus lays this out in stark terms. So we get the good news that God so loved the world, right? And we can receive new life and eternal life in him if we believe. But then he says, now against this great light, there is a great darkness that we are all condemned. And Jesus goes on to illustrate the point by saying this, and this is the judgment, John 3, 19. That light has come into the world. He, of course, was talking about himself, right? As John tells us in the opening section of this gospel, the light has entered the world. It says, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light. Why? Well, because their actions Their lifestyle, their choices, their hearts were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his or her works would be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen 
that his or her works have been carried out in God. So we have to look at what this means. So this is the next point. Labeled it the judgment of light. Light as a judge. Light as a revealer of what is true. And Jesus says, let me tell you about the light and people's response to it. Get this picture in your mind. So the judge enters the courtroom and says he's ready to render his verdict. This is verse 19. And can you imagine as the defendant, the angst and anticipation of what is going to be said because what is said matters. Now, if our original sin wasn't bad enough, and it was, there is now this additional stuff. Even when the light of Christ came, we ignored him. Why? Well, simply and tragically because we love darkness, sin, instead of the light. That's why this charge came. That is, those sinful deeds gave us a kind of light blindness. You ever been in the dark for very long and then the light comes in? We just can't see it. Light. Shut the shade. Living in the darkness. And the longer we do makes us recoil. If we're trying to hide. But if you're in the darkness like those who have been stranded in a cave. Longing to desperately be freed from this darkness. When the light comes there is great rejoicing. And embracing and thanksgiving. That finally there is freedom to go on. People have a soul deep resistance to God's own light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. People don't want their lives to be revealed, their deeds and their motives and their secrets. Verse 21. So to come to Christ is to stop hiding our sinfulness so that it may be seen plainly, plainly that what we have done has been done in the sight of God. To come to Christ is to stop hiding our sinfulness. Right? People say, well, I'll come to Christ when I clean up my life. <laughs> it's wrong. That's why Billy Graham had the song, Just As I Am, play at the end of his crusades. That was the song. Come how you are. None of us are good enough. So get over your bad self and say, yeah, I need some help. Right? And we come to the light so that God can touch us and clean us and change us. People are judged by how they respond to the light. Again, Jesus is the light of the world. And John stated in the opening lines of the gospel. People don't come to Jesus because they love the darkness, they love their sin more than him, and they don't want their actions to be exposed. It's like this story of this no man that I just read this last week. It's an old story, and it's this nomad who is camping out in the desert, and it's late at night, and he's there in his tent, and so he gets a little hungry. And so he lights the candle, and he goes over, finds his dates that are there in a bowl beside his bed, and he starts to eat. And he bites into one, and he notices that there's a worm in the date. And so he, <laughs> so he throws it out, right? But he's so hungry that he wants to eat something, so he, I'm going to try this again. He, dra he grabs another one, and he bites into it, and it also has a worm in it. So he throws it out. But because he's so hungry, he turns out, the, he blows out the candle. In case if he kept eating, you'd have no dates left, and he hungry eats them all in a hurry. 
often we're like this guy, right? Because our sinful hunger is so strong. We know if we do these things, it's not going to be good for us, but we turn out the light and do it anyway. Better way is to come clean, (laughs) to come to Christ and say, God, I need your help. But those who do what is true comes to the light so it can be clearly seen that what they had done had been carried out, what had been done, what God has done, the good things have been carried out by God. The one follows its course because its deeds are evil, the person running from God. The other follows its course not, not because its deeds are righteous, but because it longs to show that its deeds or their deeds have been done through God. Now this is what I mean by this, okay? Here's a verse that I think will be super helpful to you. Because it's helpful to me, and you're a human like I am. Okay? This is Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. This is a powerful verse. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Know what this says to me? That God is the one that gives us desire and the power to do his will. In your and I's flesh, we don't even have the desire to follow God. It's called depravity. (laughs) And it is total. But God in his mercy gives us both the desire to follow him and the power to follow him. So if you are saying, hey Dave, I am a Christian, I believe, but I am struggling. And we all struggle in certain ways. I'm not asking you to try harder and do better. I'm asking you to acknowledge your inability to follow Christ. And so this is the prayer I want you to pray. God, give me the desire to do your will. And God, give me your power to do your good pleasure. Take that home with you. That might be your sentence. God, give me the desire because I don't have it. Give me your power because I don't have it. And God says, let's go. That's a prayer he'll answer. And then you need to pray it again. We need to pray it again. Pray it again so that when we're in the light, this is what Jesus was saying, right? That it'll be seen what God has done in us, right? God has changed me, gave me a new heart so that I can love him and follow him and do good as he asks so that God is glorified, not saying, look what I've done, I'm awesome, right? It's not it. God gave me the desire to do good because in me, I don't even have the desire. I desire to do evil. Thank you very much. God, I need to be forgiven of the evil I've done. God, I need your spirit to change my heart. God, I need your power to do it. And so as we are in Christ, we can see, we can say, God, thank you for doing this in me and through me and in spite of me sometimes. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't. Do people love evil more than Christ? Love the darkness more than Christ? The answer to that is yes. But God in his great mercy called us to himself. Now John, this apostle who wrote this gospel, also wrote the letters 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, also wrote the book of Revelation, In 1 John, he says this about the light. 1 John chapter 5. This is the message we heard from him, which is Christ, and proclaimed to you, which is us, that God is indeed 
light. And in him is no darkness at all, so he is the great light. Verse 6, so if we say we have fellowship with him, right? I'm connected to God, I'm following him, yet while we still walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. Belief connected to action, that is true faith. We do not practice the truth, but if we walk in the light, God helps us to do this as he is in the light. What happens? We have connection, fellowship, deep relationship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That's good news. And so it is up to us to believe, to trust in, to give our life to and follow Christ in the light, his work in us, giving us the desire and the power to follow him and to forsake the darkness and to invite people into the God who indeed loves the world. If you want relationship with God, you go to God and trust him to do his work in you. If you want relationship, good, godly relationship with one another, we don't hide because God's mercy is more. We praise him for this, which takes humility, honesty, transparency, acknowledgement, of who we are to walk truly and rightly with God and others. So we're landing. And if musicians could come up, that'd be awesome. Okay. So I don't know what has, and hopefully something has, impacted you today. And there are treasures in this passage. There's a lot to think about and a lot to respond to. My hope is, again, that perhaps you've gained understanding in the difference between believing about things about Christ and believing in Christ. Think about this. Perhaps your understanding has grown in knowing the exact, reasons, the exact reason Jesus was sent into the world and to save the world from their sin. Perhaps you've been helped knowing that God truly does love you because he sent his son for you and perhaps that's what you need to hear today. Perhaps you need to ask God for help to give you both the desire and the power to follow him and do so. And so th today, in preparation, you saw a, um, a, a song of, of repentance, a, 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 a psalm of per, uh, repentance, and a song of repentance, and a prayer that we would look and then praise and trust in Christ. So I'm going to give us a moment to reflect on this. Right? And in this time of reflection, and then I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll conclude with a song. We're just going to pause and just talk with God for a moment or two. Rest, be at peace, allow him to speak to you. So we're just going to pause for a moment and asking you just to talk with God. Jesus, we are so grateful for your spirit working among us. I am grateful for the people, we are grateful for the people who have gathered in this place. God, I know that you yourself brought us here, gave us the desire to be here.
And God, we ask that we would be people who are drawn to and attracted and believe in the light. Thank you for forgiving us, washing us by the pure water which is in you. God, thank you for giving us a new heart for a heart of stone that comes by your spirit. Thank you for your pursuing of us. Thank you for your great love for us that all who come to you can have new life in you. And God, I ask, Father, that in this place that there be continued growth and new life coming from us. In our community where we live, who we talk to, God, give us the desire and the power to do your good pleasure. And God, I ask that we would feel that. We know the love of God and the mercy of God. And that we would be at peace in you and at peace with you. And that you would continue to guide us in faith and in obedience because we see you as the good and great authority. Thank you for your great love and mercy. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen.